Hey, how are you today? This is Josh Patrick, and you're at Cracking the Cash Flow Code. And my guest today is Jack Tompkins. And Jack is an expert on helping blue collar businesses become data driven. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's bring Jack on and we'll start the conversation. Hey, Jack, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing great, Josh. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So let's start there. Um, how do you, uh, what would you say about, um, you know, being data driven? Why is that important? Let's start there. So I, uh, I've always been a fairly data driven person, but I know a lot of businesses, myself included, uh, got into business with their gut instinct and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm a huge fan of it. I use my gut all the time. Um, incorporating data though, it, it opens up kind of a new door and you fully see your performance. You can completely dive into the numbers. You can completely see what's working from a marketing perspective, what's working from a specific job type perspective and what's most profitable. And you can get into all those different numbers and really help grow your business. Um, I like to say that you can be completely right with your gut instinct, but you could be completely profitable with the help of data too. So um, what kind of numbers would, you know, let's, let's take this in, a beginning, medium, and expert. Mm -hmm. So someone who is not data-driven at all, just kind of goes by their gut and goes out and does work and looks at a checkbook and hopes the balance is getting a little bit bigger every week. Um, what would be the sort of pieces of data that that sort of business owner would want to know? It comes down to some stuff that is not rocket science by any means. It is... Think on the financial side, revenue and profit. Um, on the marketing side, think leads and conversions. And then what I call kind of the operational side, the actual doing of the tasks or the work or whatever it is that you do. Um, uh, things like timing around it, time from start to finish, and, and kind of those logistical pieces there. Um, so it's stuff that you already probably have a decent grasp of offhand. It's just kind of putting them to paper and seeing, okay, here's where the trend is going. Again, this is working well, this is not working well. So the beginning level is start with the things that you're thinking of probably fairly often anyways, but just getting some more formality behind it. Cool. Okay. So that's the beginning guys. Those are pretty basic things. How about we get it up to medium? Someone that is keeping that stuff already and they say, okay, this is nice, but what's the next level we can go to? Yeah, then you start getting one level deeper. So from there, you could say not just revenue and profit, but it can get into some things like gross margins and labor costs and, and things like that. Um, and I would say at that medium level, um, actually, I'll back up a second. At the beginning level, you might want to see those numbers in just a checkbook. And that's kind of the visual component of it. At the medium level, it might be looking at the QuickBooks kind of preloaded dashboards, if you will, or even putting things into Excel and tracking things there. So you have that what kind type of, of things would you be what kind of things would you be looking at though? In terms of like metrics and whatnot? Yeah, I mean what metrics mean? Okay, I've got these basic metrics I'm looking at. Now I want to go to the next level. What specific metrics would I want to have at that point? I'd say again, the gross margin is going to be huge in, in pretty much every blue collar business. Um, things like labor costs too, uh, which may or may not be included depending on your accounting structure. Um, those are going to be some two really big ones. On the marketing side, it's where your lead's coming from and uh, where your conversion's coming from too, for that matter. Whether you do Facebook advertising, Google ads, anything like that. Um, it's, it's sort of that, all right, let's break it down a little bit further and see where things are coming from. Okay, so let's talk about gross margin for a bit, because that's really, in my opinion, a hugely important intermediate number for somebody. Agreed. And, um, you know, I find, especially in blue collar businesses, that they don't really understand very often what drives that gross margin. So when you're working with a business owner and you're teaching them about their dashboards or teaching them about this, this component, how do you go about teaching them how to figure out what actually drives the gross profit? 
Gotcha. It's a good question because it does, it can vary a bit from business to business, but I guess sort of the overall answer that might apply to more businesses than not, it's, it's kind of sticking with the definition of, of gross margin, which is the things that you need to spend in order to get the job done. And that could be parts, that could be materials, that could be labor, um, things like that. So where it's, you know, if you get a thousand dollars for a job, but you had to put in twelve hundred dollars of parts, obviously that's going to be a negative gross margin. Where the sort of not obvious case, if we go back to beginner medium, um, comes in is if you charge a thousand bucks because you mark everything up twenty percent, so great your, you know, gross uh, cost of goods sold rather is roughly eight hundred dollars on a thousand dollar job. Then you would say, okay, can I do anything about that? Is there anything that I can shrink there? Is all of that necessary? Um, or should I mark it up 25% or 30% because um, there's more things that are involved than just the one part that I'm installing or, or something along those lines? Yeah, when we deal with gross margin with folks, we start off looking at the gross margin, obviously. And then we say, what are the components that are in there? And it's usually labor and materials. And we look at the markup on each. We might like take a look at labor and say, okay, we're spending X dollars per hour. And what are we actually utilizing? What's we, what are we getting per hour? And if we're paying 30 and we're getting $60 per hour, we probably have a problem. Same thing on materials. If our material markup is 20% and, we're, and our gross margin is not right and our labor is right, well, it means we probably have to adjust that material gross margin. Right. And the thing I found, which I found was really interesting, is that we have a, um, a security company client that you install in security systems. And over the last five years, their mix of product versus labor in a job has become tilted way towards labor. And as a result, their jobs are becoming way more profitable. So we started looking at saying, what kind of jobs can we go after that have a high labor component? And they used to believe that without a higher material component, they were losing money, which right. I found really interesting. Yeah, that's such a good one. Because you think, oh, the more people are working, the less profitable we probably are, right? Right. But you look at the numbers and you find the other, like, that's a really cool story. I like that. Yeah, I mean, they're actually, I mean, they're... Uh, billing to labor, their utilization of labor costs is three and a half times. Wow. Meaning that if they pay somebody $30 an hour, their average labor rate they're getting is three and a half times that. Yeah. So we focus good. on that really heavily with that yeah. particular group. I okay, like let's that. move let's move to level three, which is the advanced folks. Yes. And I want to see if you have the same report that I have which I think every business owner needs to look at. So if you're in level three where, okay, you're doing all those intermediate things, what's the steps past that that you would want to look at? So you're kind of just moving down the income statement on the financial side. And that is where else are you spending money? So we've got the gross margin covered. We've got the cost of goods sold figured out. Now it is, what else are we doing? Is the marketing expense huge? Um, are things like insurance really big factors? Is payroll obviously a huge one there? Um, all those things that kind of are in that, you could call it overhead, you call it fixed expenses, you call it variable expenses. Things in those buckets on the income statement are gonna be huge um, in terms of your net profit. Um, obviously if it's an owner operated, um, the owners pay how much they're taking, whether that's an owner's draw or anything like that. Um, are they paying more than they paying themselves more than they should? Is that impacting the business negatively? Um, things like that. On the marketing and operational side, you could get into things like cost per acquisition for marketing, um, which basically means okay, we're spending. I'm just going to use general numbers again: a thousand bucks through all of these different marketing channels, and that gets us an average of. I don't know, one customer. So then our cost per acquisition is $1,000. And so getting into metrics like that um, is, is definitely kind of that next level, maybe expertise um, level on the marketing side. So where would a cash flow statement fit in here? 
<laughs> the cash flow is great. Um, I'm glad that you bring this up. And obviously on cracking the cash flow, um, I'm, we got to talk about it. It's a huge piece because right, cash is cash is always king. And so the difference between your AR, your accounts receivable and your accounts payable and things like that, that'll make or break your business regardless of what business you're in. If there's not cash on hand to do things, um, then right, your, your business is kind of going to at least struggle. So once the income statement is figured out, and obviously the cash flow is kind of a, um, the result of things on the income statement and balance sheet. Once those are figured out, then I totally agree. Getting into the cash flow statement is going to really help time out when projects happen, when you need to get paid, how much um, you might charge for a late fee and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, he also will tell you that you can be profitable and run out of cash. Right. I mean, that happened. it actually happened to me. And the reason was I had no idea how to read a cash flow statement. And we were buying a million and a half dollars worth of vending machines a year. And that million and a half dollar cash outlay doesn't show up on your income statement. Right. So most business owners I know can read an income statement pretty well. They sort of understand a, a balance sheet, but they don't have a clue. And this is some sophisticated business owners that I know don't have a clue about how to read the cash flow statement. So in fact, this actually happened to a client of mine. Um, and it happened to me also, except this guy doubled his business in three years. And he didn't realize that it cost 23 cents for every dollar they added in business to expenses wow. for inventory and receivables and equipment. And he actually ended up running looking at running out of cash, luckily his business balance sheet was strong enough where he could go and borrow the money to fill that cash deficit and the bank was glad to loan it to him. But now we have them looking at that cash flow statement on a weekly basis to understand what happens to the cash. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a good one. Once you get, especially to a certain size, um, where's the cash going to your point, you can be completely profitable, but not be able to pay for anything. And it's, it's a very interesting situation. Um, the cash flow is not an easy one to read. Absolutely not. Um, I yeah, always like I reading find, things. I find it's the most difficult statement to read Yeah, and the most important one to understand. Right, right. It's one of those, well, like we call it, it's kind of at that expert level. Yeah. I typically uh, spend five to seven sessions with somebody before they understand the cash flow statement. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's just, it's counterintuitive. You look at, you know, your inventory go up and that's the use of cash. And you look at your inventory go down, you think that would be a bad thing was actually a source of cash. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the same thing with receivables. Your receivables go up and you say, gee, that's a good thing. But that you're using cash when you do that. Right. And if you don't understand that, um, it's pretty easy to end up in a position where you're just flat out of cash. Right. Um, one thing I was actually talking about this morning was the PPP loans. Um, a lot of those are kind of deferred revenue. So they, on the balance sheet, they're classified as a liability because you have to do something with them. But that doesn't mean that it reflects the same on the cash flow statement. So it, it it's a very good point that things kind of can get wonky and, and maybe unintuitive on the cash flow statement. So let's talk about another thing. Let's talk about backlog. Okay. Do you, do you um, ask your people to track backlog? And if so, why? Um, the folks that I have talked with, um, I like tracking backlog. And I, I we do talk about that a bit. Um, why do we track it? It's kind of what is yet to come. And, and a high amount of backlog or a large amount of projects in backlog. Um, is not necessarily a bad thing. It's typically a good thing, I would think. Um, maybe some, uh, some businesses think differently, but that means you have obviously things to come in the future, cash to come in the future. I could see the negative side absolutely where it is. We can't get to this, and you know maybe people want service right away. Maybe it's just we need to hire more to get this done right away. But then hiring becomes another issue. So. 
I, I totally see both sides of it, but I do lean towards um, tracking it because it is a indicator of future events. Yeah, well, we that's we actually believe the metrics that are most important are the ones that are predictable about what's going to happen to your business in the future. Right. We look at your your P and L and your balance sheet is a good thing, but that's history. Right. I mean, it's it's good to tell you about what happened in the past, but it's got nothing that's going to tell you in the future. And, and the two things that we find that will tell you what's going to happen in the future. This is in a company that, say, a construction company or somebody like along those lines to do projects, manufacturing, is that how much do you have in your backlog? And what is the activity and proposal level of your sales team? Those two things are going to tell you what's happening in your future 60, 90 days down the road. And if you're not tracking those two things, you don't know them well, there's a good chance you're going to have a problem. Now, backlog is good or it could be bad. Depends how low it is or how big it is. You know, it is possible. We have a, a client right now where their backlog is actually too big and they're going to start having clients who are going to complain because it's taking too long to get to the jobs. So what we told that particular business is that it's time for you to hire another crew. Right. So that sort of information, in my opinion, is just absolutely um, you know, critical when it comes to telling what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. And, and the same, same thing with sales activity. I mean, if I know that, you know, for every 10 calls somebody makes to get three appointments, which creates one sale. Well, if I'm not tracking the appointments they have, which is really the critical thing and how many proposals we're putting out and what our closing ratio is, then there's a pretty good chance that that backlog will start shrinking. And the reason it starts shrinking is because our salespeople aren't doing the job right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a really good indicator of a lot of things to your point. And one thing that it's kind of on one end of the spectrum on my business is kind of that forecasting and budgeting and projecting. Um, everybody kind of wants to have that or, or knows that they should have that. And you could say, Oh, we're going to grow 10% this year. That's great. And that means it's going to show like this for every month. That's all well and good, but backlog is such a better indicator and it's a real indicator of these are real things that are going to come in to your point, 60, 90 days, um, even further in some cases. And so you can use that of, okay, if we keep the backlog steady and we keep growing that, everything else kind of falls into place in theory. Yeah, in theory, but if the backlog starts to drop, then you have to start looking under the hood <laughs> and saying, right. what are your... What is, what's causing this to happen. I mean, we just become this really efficient machine and we can do more business now. I right. mean, one of the things we ask people to do is use a technology called scrum if they're project based. Yeah. Because it, it will help them improve their productivity. And when I use it with contractors, we typically take 30 or 40% of labor out of jobs. So we might have a, a healthy backlog as we're introducing scrum. And we find that backlog shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. Well, it's not because we've been doing things badly. It's because we've been doing things well. And what we need to do at that point is probably focus on sales. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I'm actually a big fan of Scrum too. I love, um, I do two week sprints in my business a lot of time too. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's when something becomes more efficient, right? Whether it's a technology use or just, even a mindset or anything like that and things start slowing it's kind of a again an unintuitive result of becoming more efficient and faster to to complete things um but it does give you that heads up of hey here's what's happening this is the new way that the business is going so we need to bring a, in a whole lot more business or you could start charging more or whatever to compensate for it but Ideally, you do want to do some sort of compensation. So it's it's an interesting business discussion. That's another good point. So how do you how do you use metrics to test pricing? This is a good one. Um, I, I know we're we're close to coming up on time here, so I'll I'll keep it brief. Using metrics to test out pricing. Well, there's a couple ways you could do it. One is looking at okay, we want to be at X percent gross margin or X percent net profit, whichever margin you're looking at. 
um, and say, okay, that means we need to price this way. Great, we did it, we priced it, we've got the margin. However, revenue has declined because we scared too many people off. And so then you go the other way, okay, let's let's pile in revenue and then kind of, you know, this is a lackadaisical way to say it, but see where the margins fall. And then you say, okay, we need to kind of find the middle ground between those two. So it's, it is an interesting, do you want to start with the end goal in mind? Or do you want to start with, it's kind of like, do you want to start with the top line in mind or start with the bottom line in mind? And, and then kind of meander through or the that. Gross, or the gross margin in mind. Right, right, exactly. Yes, yeah, that's a better way to say it instead of the top line. Yeah, yeah. I like to, I like to compensate salespeople based on gross margin, not gross sales. I think that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, because they're just getting jobs that cost a whole lot. Good job, but you're not helping the company as much as you could. Right. So one of the things that we do is we say, okay, with your sales uh, team, you need to track all lost business, which is easier than you think. And you need to find out why people are saying no, they're not saying yes. And if they're only saying no because of price, one or two percent of the time, I can guarantee your prices are too low. Right. If they're saying no over 10 percent of the time, your prices are probably inching up towards too high. So around 10 percent, if you're not hearing 10 percent no on price, my guess is your prices are too low and you need to start experimenting by inching them up. Now, it's another the same client again. I had them raise their prices 5 percent now. Um, every two months. Wow. And they're still not hearing no's. I I think, you know, the owner doesn't think this, but I think they can raise their prices another 20% because they are significantly below the nationals. And they only want to be 10 or 15% below the nationals, not 40% below. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a scary process, but it's, I mean, it's worth testing. One no well, could tell you a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, if I raise my price 20% and I lose 5% of my business, I'm 15% of the head of the game. So why do I care? <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> so, Jack, uh, unfortunately, as you as you said just a couple of minutes ago, we were running short on time, and we are, and we're out of time. So if people want to find you and have you help them put together a dashboard and metrics, how would they go about doing that? Best way is to uh, find my website. Um, again, my name, my company name is Pineapple Consulting Firm. So the website is Pineapple CF, as in Pineapple Consulting Firm. dot com. I've got all sorts of ways to contact me: examples, videos, before and afters, and and all that fun stuff there. And I have two things I would like you to do. Number one, which is you're listening to this podcast recording, or maybe you're watching on YouTube or Facebook Live. But if you do listen to podcasts, go to wherever you listen to your podcast, and please give us an honest rating and review. It's really important. It helps people find us. And the more reviews and ratings we get, um, the more people can listen to the show. Now, if you love us, tell us you love us. And if you hate us, I hope that's not true. But if you hate us, you can say that too. And I'll just cry a little bit. And the second thing I want you to do is I have just published my second book, The Sale Ready Company. And it's a continuation of our parable with the Aardvark family. The folks who have read it, I find this really interesting. Even people not in business are telling me how much they enjoyed this book. And I'm just loving that. So it's easy to get. All you got to do is go to www.salereadycompany.com. You can buy the book for half price there because I want to get the book out in your hands. $7.95, it's, you know, shipping and handling is, can, is included. And we have seven or eight bonus pieces in our resource center that come with the book. So again, it's www.salereadycompany.com. And please buy the book in there. Also, after you read it, leave an honest rating and review on Amazon or wherever you, you buy books from. And this is Josh Patrick. We're with Jack Tompkins. You're at Cracking the Cash Flow Code. Thanks a lot for stopping by. I hope to see you back here really soon.